All right. Well, thanks for coming in early on the second day. Uh, we'll hopefully stay on time so we can get back to the slopes. So I'm from Southern California, Orange County, and uh, it's a privilege to be up here. It's great this week, so uh, we'll try and, again, stay on time, get out of here by 10 o'clock. So I'm talking about cervical artificial disc replacement versus ACDF. And if you look at the history of joint fusion, uh, these images of hips and knees might have been standard about 60 years ago, but obviously over time we figured out better ways to do this. And of course this is somewhat apples and oranges because the spine is different than a hip or knee because you have other levels to deal with. But we've pushed the envelope in other joint replacements. Uh, clearly elbows and ankles have higher complication and failure rates than hips and knees. And I think we're all a little bit discouraged as to what we thought was very promising in lumbar disc arthroplasty, but hasn't really panned out over time like we were hoping. So I was actually one of the skeptics. You know, as mentioned yesterday, I've been in practice 20 years now, so I've seen some things that were promising that failed, and, you know, I've become more of someone who's a little bit jaded, and so I wasn't early into cervical disc arthroplasty. I was one of those people that said, I'm going to wait and see how this goes, and I don't see a good reason to change my practice yet, because the anterocervical fusion simply works so well. But there's clearly a rationale for artificial disc replacement in the cervical spine. You want to preserve natural motion. You want to theoretically protect the adjacent levels. And you can avoid some of the problems of fusion, such as pseudarthrosis. Also, you can do beneficial things to the patient for things like having less brace time after surgery or return to work or activity quicker. So Hillebrand's study in 99 in GBGS taught us all that the incidence of adjacent level disease was roughly 3% per year. And it's still arguable how much of that is natural history versus the rigidity of the fusion, but clearly that plays some role. So these are the eight current cervical discs that are FDA approved on the market. They're all similar. They all tend to have a polycore except one which is metal on metal. Some are slightly more constrained than others, but none of them are very constrained, so they really don't control uh, sagittal alignment, for example. So that's one of the things we'll talk about that you have to be a little careful of with this technology. So in 2009, a biomechanical study clearly showed that with two-level arthroplasty versus fusion, there were fairly significant kinematic differences. Uh, not only did fusion obviously limit motion at the operated levels, but it caused the adjacent levels to be hypermobile, which was the rationale why we seem to see adjacent level disease. And it also showed biomechanically, based on kinematics, that two-level arthroplasty both preserved motion at the operated levels as well as preserving fairly natural motion at the adjacent levels. A follow-up study in 2012 confirmed all of this for two levels, but also added the concept of a hybrid, where if you could preserve motion at maybe just one of the two levels, there was still significant benefit when looking at the kinematics. So the first five-year follow-up on one of these was the metal on metal. And uh, it showed very good symptomatic improvement, NDI, VAS, in both the cervical disc arthroplasty and fusion. So the question then remains, how do you convince a skeptic like me to get on board with new technology if all we're showing is that they're equivalent? We're not showing any improvement, so what's the point? Well, now that we have better follow-up, we can see that the reason they were only equivalent is because our numbers simply weren't high enough. We didn't have the power yet to show the difference. It was trending. It just wasn't significant statistically. And the other is that we were only dealing with one-level studies. And as I mentioned with the two-level kinematics, you have more of a difference with a two-level procedure. A one-level fusion isn't the same as a two-level fusion. A two-level fusion alters kinematics more, and it has a higher failure rate with, for example, pseudarthrosis. <coughs> So once we actually saw the two-level studies coming out with good follow-up data, we could show a significant improvement in arthroplasty versus fusion. And if you look at some of the criteria, such as NDI, you can see that at every time point, immediately post-op all the way to five years, even though both groups improved significantly versus pre-op, uh, disc replacement improved significantly more than fusion. This was also true with SF12 and physical component summary. You had dramatic improvement in both groups, but you had more improvement in the two-level disc arthroplasty group. When you look at the reoperation rates, I think we all assumed that the one potential theoretical advantage of arthroplasty when we first started doing these was adjacent level disease. Hopefully you'd see less 
adjacent level <laughs> surgery. And that's, of course, what this is showing by a fairly dramatic amount, a, a over threefold amount. But I think the one that was somewhat less expected is you're also seeing more than a three-fold reoperation rate in the two-level fusions versus the arthroplasty. And I think, at least for me, that was somewhat unexpected. So if you look at the overall success rate at five years for the two-level study, and this is fairly rigid criteria, so those numbers aren't that high, but in TDR it's 61%, and ACDF it's 31%. So this went well beyond looking at non-inferiority and actually showed superiority for two-level arthroplasty. So contraindications. There's clearly a whole list. You can't have significant facet degeneration, instability, deformity, severe spondylosis, malignancy, infection, OPLL, rheumatoid arthritis, or osteopenia are some of the causes for that, like chronic steroid use. I think when you look at an x-ray like that one there, most of us would feel that's beyond what you'd probably offer the patient in arthroplasty. One of the side effects of practicing in coastal Southern California is I often have patients who walk in the door and tell me what operation I'm going to give them. I think we all now with the internet have some of this experience, but particularly in my part of the country, it's very common. So this was someone who came in, a 45-year-old teacher, chronic neck pain, bilateral radiculopathy, had failed conservative measures, had some weakness on exam, who had researched and told me, I want artificial disc replacement. That's what you're going to give me. But when you look at their kyphotic deformity, which is around 20 degrees and three-level disease, the question is, like with MIS yesterday, should we give patients what they want? Obviously, a lot of this is patient-driven. Or should we try and be the adult in the room and temper their enthusiasm for some new technology where there's really not an indication? So I had to tell her I didn't think it was the right operation. She was upset with me but kept coming back. And about six months later, consented to this. So I did a three-level ACDF where I restored her lordosis. She did very well clinically and I think in the end was happy with what we had done. This is a 25-year-old male laborer who was wrestling aggressively with his friend and heard and felt a pop in his neck. He had acute neck pain. He had some numbness and weakness into his right upper extremity. And he presented to me two weeks later with some triceps weakness and some decreased sensation in C7. And these initial images are fairly unimpressive. Don't see much on the MRI. On the x-ray, there's a little bit of widening of the inner spinous distance there at C6-7. So I further studied him with flexion extension views and a CT. You can see some kyphosis on the CT at C6-7, and the flexion view really shows the story. Uh, you've got widening of the inner spinous distance. You've got kyphosis. Clearly, this is unstable, and this is someone who's not a candidate for arthroplasty. You could have treated this posteriorly. Uh, I chose to do this. He did well. This is a 47-year-old dentist who's having increased difficulty at work because of numbness and weakness in his dominant hand, upper extremity, failed conservative measures. He has some weakness on exam, and he's got two-level disease on MRI. Now, when you look at the amount of collapse on his x-ray, it's about 50%. And a lot of the arthroplasty studies will talk about 50% being about the cutoff for not wanting to go beyond that. But I think part of this is our assumption that we should look at the lumbar literature. And if you have more than 50% collapse in a lumbar disc, you can assume you've got symptomatic facet disease and someone's not an arthroplasty candidate. But is that true in the cervical spine? The facets are obviously different. And maybe you can do even more than 50%. Some of the newer criteria is talking about maybe up to 70% collapse. So I pushed the envelope and offered him a two-level arthroplasty. He did very well. And if you don't recognize this particular implant, uh, this is the Simplify study we were involved in recently, just completed the two-level IDE for the FDA. Complications of disc arthroplasty. Subsidence, migration, kyphosis, heterotopic ossification. If you look closely at these images, uh, I wonder if we should be doing this at all. But if you look now at the meta-analysis of all eight FDA trials for the approved devices on the market and combine them, there are over 3,000 patients that were randomized. And when you look at now this data we have, it's very clear that the relative risk of fusion is higher from a neurologic standpoint. It's higher from a repeat surgery standpoint. And when you look at other meta-analyses, it confirms that there's greater improvement in NDI and functional outcomes with arthroplasty. So this is a 48-year-old bus driver with progressive neck pain and bilateral upper extremity weakness, difficulty performing his activities of daily living as well as his job duties, failed conservative measures. 
And interestingly, on exam, his weakness with wrist extension and decreased sensation in C6 was more consistent with the C5-6 level as opposed to C6-7, which is the collapse level on x-ray. So you can see there's certainly protrusions at both levels on MRI, but based on those, I felt that if I did offer him an operation, should probably treat both levels. But with the advanced collapse at C6-7, did not feel that was appropriate for arthroplasty, so offered him a hybrid procedure, so he did quite well. I'm showing this because on the left slide there, the lateral, this is the LDR Moby C implant, which myself and several of our colleagues anecdotally have seen. Because this device is a little less constrained than the others, some migration, particularly of the upper end of the implant, tending to translate anteriorly and somewhat causing a listhesis, if not a kyphosis. So um, time will tell whether maybe this implant isn't ideal compared to some others because of its lack of constraint. This is a 52-year-old accountant with bilateral radiculopathy, chronic neck pain, failed conservative measures, and you can see two-level disease. As opposed to the other case I showed where there's about 50% collapse, there is at these levels as well, there's also an anterolisthesis at the adjacent C4-5 level. And we've all seen this many times. It's the natural history of when the lower levels become spondylotic and start to stiffen. You have the taller disc above that becomes hypermobile and it starts to listhese. So it begs the question, if that's the natural history, which isn't ideal, why are we offering someone an operation that further stiffens those lower two levels? Are we really doing any favors to C4-5? And I would argue we're not. Uh, but if you look at that collapse at C5-6 and C6-7, are we really preserving any motion if we think about arthroplasty? Well, I think we are, because here's the post-operative images, and in decompressing the area, distracting those open, uh, clearly there is some preserved motion at those levels, and I think that uh, certainly in my practice, as I started as a skeptic, I'm finding myself more and more starting to think about arthroplasty in some of these cases because of both the data and my own uh, experience myself. I'm going to, I think, save the next case or two just because we want to stay on time. So I'll hold off and finish there, and we'll continue when we get to the case presentation. So uh, I think we'll go to the next talk. This is going to be on cervical myelopathy, anterior versus posterior approach. Uh, Jason Tinley.